Well, good to be with you this morning. Good to be up and out. <laughs> Who said that amen? <laughs> I got an amen there, preacher. <laughs> I want to thank you for praying for me. I, I wound up with... <laughs> He's practicing for the service. Uh, you know, when you tear a tendon in your leg, it's good to have it on the same leg where you have a torn tendon in the ankle. And so that way you got just one bum leg. But thank you for praying uh, for me and I thank you for being here this morning. I'd rather be here than on the 10th floor of Forest General Hospital. <laughs> one day I got on the elevator at Forest General and they, they were saying, uh, somebody say three, somebody say four, I said 10. They looked at me, said, that'll be on the roof. I said, well, we don't wanna go there. But thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for being a part of the service at Main, Main Street. I was just telling somebody about our Main Street Bible School we had back uh, in the days before when Main Street Church was on Main Street. Diane, speaking of Bible School, we'd like to remind workers, and if you can't help in Bible School, uh, five o'clock this afternoon, she's having a VBS meeting. I've done and been a part of Bible Schools for probably 60 <clears throat> years or more. And that is, to me, one of the best evangelistic reaches and outreaches of the church. So I encourage you to be a part of Bible school if you can help, to bring children if you can, so that they can be taught the gospel during vacation Bible school. There's a several announcements you see printed for you here. I'd also like to remind you of our uh, annual church picnic will be on Sunday, July the 2nd, 12.30 p.m., Thanks, Pat, for arranging that for us at Lake Serene Clubhouse. Thank you for being here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we continue our service. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I thank you for your word that says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. And just as the word says, Father, I pray that you would be with our preaching this morning. You will be with our singing. I pray that everything that is said and done may be done to honor you, the true and the living God. Father, I thank you for each one here this morning. Many cannot come like Joanne and Brother George, and I pray that you would meet their needs, whatever they may be today. Father, may we turn aside from the cares of this day and the cares of this world to look to you, Father, the author and the finish of our faith. Thank you for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, everyone. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hello, how are you guys today? Hope you're doing fine. And as we stand, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance. And you just look around to your neighbor and once again tell him it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hair of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story.
that grace. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, appear with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my song.
sing holy 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 lord god almighty early in the morning Song shall rise. 
in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Amen. You may be seated.
Uh, if I can't preach after that, my wood is wet. Amen. What a beautiful song. Thank you so much. What a great message in that song. How powerful. How powerful. Thank you, Joe Bell, very, very much. We are in 2 Corinthians 11. We have 11, 12, and 13, and we will have completed 2 Corinthians. I hope that 2 Corinthians has been as much an encouragement for you as it has been for me. And um, I think I said this at the outset, I never preached through 2 Corinthians until I began this. And, uh, oh, I've preached verses here and there. Y'all know how that is. But um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful journey through a great letter. Let's stand. We're going to read the first four verses uh, this morning. And um, then we'll get in to the Word of God. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Father, the Word of God speaks clearly, and I pray you'll give me the ability to express this message in the unction of the Spirit. And as the text describes, may no other spirit speak in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, my beloved wants to be here, but uh, one of those summertime sinus infections has her waylaid. So uh, she's at home croaking like a little tiny frog, you know. Um, so uh, pray for her that she'll be over this very soon. I want to tell you something. I have done more weddings since I came to 38th Avenue than I did in all the years before I came to 38th Avenue. I did. Now, I did a few weddings on the mission field, just to be sure that you understand, during that 20 years on the mission field, I was involved in, in, in that ministry as well. Because we would come up on couples, we would lead them to Christ, and inevitably, in the first moments, I'm talking days after they came to Christ, without us prompting anything, because we never asked this when we met a couple, they'd say, we're not married, we need to get married. You see, the Holy Spirit creates that sense of purity in your heart. And they would want to make things right. And so, that was a blessing. In fact, I'll be doing a wedding fairly soon. I'm not sure when in July, but sometime probably in July with one of our couples in the Hispanic church. And speaking of which, you should have seen this place last night. Um, it was a blessing. We had 17 guests in a couple's banquet last night with the Hispanics. It was wonderful, privilege to be there. Well, back to the wedding thing. That was a rabbit. Back to the wedding thing. There's nothing more beautiful than seeing that, that couple, uh, you know, as they stand before you. And there they are, and they're, you know, uh, in their, their uh, very best that they can have. There they are in that moment. It's joyous, and it's, it's, it's 
pleasant and and even though the ceremony may not go perfectly because you know sometimes one time I was at a wedding watching the, the ring bearer threw up all over the floor you know things like that can happen I saw one the other day where the groom passed out you know that kind of stuff goes on it happens and even though all of that it's still beautiful isn't it but you know what I like better than that I guess I'm sadistic. I like the chaos beforehand. <laughs> I really do. Watching them when they're back here in the back rooms all getting ready and they're all panicking, running around. And you see these ladies running out with rollers in their hair and, and curling irons in their hands and, and all this stuff going on. And, and they're all screaming and yelling, not in anger, but in excitement. And it's just the chaos. The chaos as they get ready for the wedding. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Getting ready for the wedding. Because you see, it won't be long. I'm persuaded of this. It won't be long before there'll be a mighty shout. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that there will be a shout have you ever wondered what that shout is? I think I know because in, in the book of Matthew, it tells us about the shout. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And I believe that's the shout. That the Lord is coming. The Lord himself will descend. There'll be a sound of a trumpet. The clouds will be rolled back like a scroll. The dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them in the air and will finally be ready for the wedding. And what a glorious celebration that'll be. Let me share with you five truths about getting ready for the wedding. And these are, there'll be no PowerPoint today. These five truths are, are um, jealousy and purity and subtlety, simplicity and loyalty. These things are all in our text right here. Every single one of them. So let me talk to you about these, beginning with, with jealousy. And let me share that with you. Now, did you know that this may be the least mentioned divine attribute about God? Are y'all aware of that? Um, he tells us in verse 2, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Now think about those divine attributes for just a moment, if you would, please. God is sovereign, holy, righteous, immutable, omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, merciful, good. And everybody here thought of God as love. You may have thought of that first, but jealousy? God is jealous? Why, yes. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And he is. God is not jealous of you. He is by no means capricious. But God is jealous for you. God is jealous over you because he knows that the enemy wants to destroy your life. And so he's jealous over you for that. He wants your life to reflect a relationship with him. He wants your values to be shaped by your faith, both who and what you believe, and not what you believe to be shaped by your values. Now, you didn't get that, so I'm going to back up and say it again. In this fallen world in which we live, values shape beliefs. And then there are actions. But when a person repents, God turns that around and beliefs 
shape values which then reveal themselves in actions. Show me your checkbook and I can show you what you value. Show me your credit card statement from your online purchases and I can show you what you value. God is jealous over you for you, for your um, beliefs to shape those values so that you choose the right things. That's his desire in your life. That's what he wants of you and of me. Now, a godly couple will be jealous for one another, over one another. The husband will be jealous to protect his wife. Now that might trigger somebody. That's okay. This, the, 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 the heresy, the blasphemy of feminism, the feminist movement has told you ladies that you don't need your man. Let me tell you something. It is not good for man to live alone. But let me tell you something. You were created to be by his side. Does that mean everybody get married? By no means. Not at all. God doesn't always plan that. But I want you to know when he does plan that, one of the roles of the husband is to protect his family and to protect his wife. Now, the wife will be jealous over her husband to keep him and to ensure that his primary encouragement from people comes from her. The Bible says in Proverbs that a contentious woman is like dripping rain. That's what it says. Ladies, don't be a big drip. Be an encouragement. Be a glass of cold water. Used to stay with my grandparents when they lived over in the Sweetwater community in Jones County, and I'd stay there every summer, and they had well water. And um, I remember when they actually had a pump put in that thing. I was a little boy, but I remember it. And the water was so good. The name of the community came from the taste of the water. Well, they'd take a glass pitcher. Y'all remember those clear glass pitchers that had grape leaves on it and all that? They'd stick that in the refrigerator and we'd go in there in the summertime 95 degrees outside. No air conditioning in the house, by the way. And we'd go in there and we'd pour us a glass of cold water after working in those chicken houses and we're covered in all that. Never mind. Anyway, it's it was so refreshing and wonderful to have that cold glass of water. Ladies, be that for your husband. Be his encourager. Good parents will be jealous for their children, won't they? They will have their children's best interests at heart. They set parameters. They set boundaries and teach the children how to walk in godliness. They do not let the children do whatever they want to do. They don't do that. They're interested in the kinds of friends that they have. They're interested in their social media habits. They're concerned about what they learn in the 16,000 hours they will spend from kindergarten until they graduate from high school. 16,000 hours. These rascals teaching, we got godly teachers around here, but we also have some rascals. 
You don't doubt me on that. These rascals that are teaching godless doctrine. They got your kids for a long time every day. You better be jealous over them. Amen? Parents want the best life possible for their children. And don't think materially when I say that. The American dream makes us think in terms of dollars and cents. When I say that word, I'm talking about walking in truth, as the Bible says in 3 John. They want their children to be ready for marriage when and if that time comes. I have betrothed you to one husband, Paul says. Good pastors and good church leaders are jealous for the well-being of the church that they serve. Paul said this to Timothy in this way. Well, just look with me over in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look with me if you would, please. I tell you, I had more voice when I came here praying on the way here than I have now. Y'all bear with me. Listen at verse 2. Verse 2 and following in 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. While wow, that describes 2023 quite well, ladies and gentlemen. That's where we are. Paul is telling the Corinthians, as it were, there are things going on there that break my heart. They do not reflect the kind of Christ-likeness you heard me teach when I was there. They don't reflect it. And so he was jealous over them because they were being led astray by false teachers and false prophets and false apostles just as is happening today in the age in which we live. So what does he say? He says not only is jealousy key but purity. Purity. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Do you see everything Paul is saying in this? He's telling Corinth, I am your spiritual father and I have betrothed you to Christ. Now ladies and gentlemen, that's a foreign culture for us because we don't do things that way. The closest we come to it is when the father walks the bride down and the preacher says, who gives this woman to be wedded in holy matrimony? And daddy says, her mother and I. Technically, biblically, he should be saying, I do. I'm sorry. But that's where it is. The father was the one who would take the woman, his daughter, and say, this would be a good husband for you. We don't have that concept in our heads. But here, Paul said, I did this, Corinth, for you. 
So let me speak about spiritual parenthood as I talk about purity. I read a story by Dr. Jerry Vines. He's one of the SBC's premier preachers, and he's still preaching here in his mid-80s, um, going here and there. Many years ago, he's at Dolphin Way there in Mobile. A number of years back, I remember when he was there. Um, he had students from Mobile College come in, and they, they were welcoming them back to school. And a young man walked up and shook his hand and said, Dr. Vines, um, I'm your grandson. And he said, boy, what are you talking about? He said, well, let me explain. You led so-and-so to the Lord many years ago. And then he became a pastor. And he led me to the Lord. So you were his spiritual father, and he is my spiritual father. I'm your spiritual grandson. That's pretty good. Paul was a spiritual father to Timothy. Paul was a spiritual father to the church at Corinth. He planted it. He stayed with them. He discipled them. He watched over them. He was their spiritual father. Now let me give you, as he's presenting Corinth to the Lord Jesus as a chaste virgin bride, let me give you some specific truths about purity. First, there is moral purity. I heard a man some years ago say that we now live in an amoral society. I thought to myself, I think he meant immoral society. Well, we were both correct. Because you see, amorality is an attitude in which nothing is specifically right or wrong, defined by many songs like the one we used to sing when I was a teenager, swallowed up by it, it's your thing, do what you want to do, I can't tell you who to suck it to. Y'all remember that? That is indicative of the amoral culture in which we live. Today, we say, you have a truth, and you have a truth, and I have a truth. No, you don't. There is God's truth, and everything else, that's just your opinion. Not just your opinion. Immorality is the action that results from the attitude of amorality. And the first thing Peter tells his readers in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5, add to your faith virtue. And the word virtue means moral excellence. Moral excellence. The second truth is that of spiritual purity. There is moral purity, but there is also spiritual purity. I'll say it again. There were false teachers, false prophets, false apostles who were present and the Corinthians had tolerated the policy, had adopted the policy of tolerance of all and listened to these jack-legged prophets of Satan. How do I know this? In verse 4, at the end of the verse, as he speaks, he says, you may well put up with it. That phrase in the Greek points to the fact and look, you're putting up with that. That's kind of how we would paraphrase it today in 
of modern English. So, this was going on in his church. Things are not the same now, right? They're worse. <laughs> they're worse. God says they're worse. God says evil men will grow worse and worse. God teaches this. <coughs> Excuse me. But when the Lord comes, he will come for a pure church, one without wrinkle and without spot. Purity. He desires purity in your morality and purity in your spirituality and how you walk. But be careful because then Paul gives a warning and it's wrapped around the word subtlety. Now, verse 3, I fear lest somehow as Christ deceived Eve by his craftiness so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And by the way, some manuscripts add the word purity there, simplicity and purity. That's fine. It's already mentioned earlier, so if you want to add it again, I'll go ahead. But uh, New King James doesn't add it there. I looked up the word subtle uh, in two different dictionaries. I wanted to see what the English had to say about it. So I looked at the Oxford Dictionary. And I wanted to see what the Americans had to say about it. So I looked at the American Heritage Dictionary. Two different dictionaries. In the Oxford, subtle means evasive, mysterious, and hard to detect. In the American Heritage Dictionary, it means so slight as to be difficult to detect or analyze, not immediately, obviously. It also means sly and crafty, and there you have the word craftiness in your text, or clever. All of these describe Satan quite well, don't they? All of them. He's a liar, and he's an expert at his warcraft against you. And you know what the serpent did to Eve. Now, don't think you're smarter than she was. You're not. The deceptive drift in Corinth was so slight that Paul feared they did not see it. And that's how false doctrine gets into your heart. It worms its way into your heart by being false, by being just subtle in its differences. It sounds good at first. It sounds logical at first. But the doctrine the false teachers and preachers preach never ends well. Never. It can be 99% true and 1% error. And so it so sounds so smooth, it sounds good to us. In the 1980s in our convention, we were riddled with attacks on the inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture. And one prominent man interviewed by the Baptist press, I read it in our state paper, he said, they say we do not believe in inerrancy. We do. I believe in the functional inerrancy of Scripture. Others, as they went down that article, lauded the man for affirming inerrancy. And I read it again. I said, this man is slick. He's added a word. He's changed the definition of inerrancy by doing so. And he twisted 
the meaning. And that's what false teachers do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we face it again in the Southern Baptist Convention. This time, the Southern Baptist Convention, y'all going to love this. Maybe you get mad at me. It's okay. We're debating what the word pastor means. Y'all remember the Supreme Court things the other last few years ago when they asked that Supreme Court justice, do you, can you define a woman? And she said, no, I can't do that. And she is one, but she couldn't define what a woman was. Well, we is pastors, pardon my intentional slur of the grammar, but we can't define ourselves. We are debating over who may serve as pastor. They want to change the definition so we can accommodate many women in our churches and allow them to be pastors as well. That's the debate going on in the convention. You know what? Can I tell you something? Some things in Scripture are not up for debate. They just play not. But the serpent is subtle. He now knows how to set us adrift. And so what he says is, okay, you want that to not be up for debate? Fine. Just let us do it. Tolerate us. This is what he says is going on right here. After all, you need our money. God don't need anybody's money. Pardon my grammar. Satan's so subtle. He knows how to set us adrift. Sometimes he adds a word. Sometimes he questions the word. Sometimes he twists the word. We must beware of subtle changes that Satan will bring to our minds. Well, I've got to rush on through this thing, so y'all, y'all buckle up because we're about to take off and fly high for a few moments. We're going to go into the word simplicity as we look at this, and we're going to move from jealousy through purity into now simplicity not forgetting subtlety in the midst of that. When we speak of simplicity, we speak of a single-hearted devotion to Christ Jesus. When a man and a woman marry, their goal is singular. They usually only want to please their spouse and no one else. Nothing else matters. As time goes by, however, that single-hearted devotion discovers that there are competing desires. Some of those desires come from work. Some will be from personal passions and hobbies. But a wise couple will work to maintain a single-hearted devotion. Simplicity. Jesus told the Ephesian church in Revelation 2 they had left, they lost their first love. They allowed competing desires to overtake them. And they let their devotion to Christ slip second, third, fourth, I don't know what place it was in the church. But Jesus, their simplicity, their devotion to him was no longer the most important thing. Well, the word simplicity also speaks of the gospel. Aren't you glad you do not need a PhD to understand the gospel? Aren't you glad that even a child can understand God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Aren't you glad that it's that simple to be able to understand the gospel? One man said to me, we run the risk of complicating salvation to the point that it feels like we're telling people to pull vault, and pull vault into the arms of Jesus. And that's true. You want to be saved? Here are the 52 steps you must take in order to be saved. We do this, I'm afraid. 
Nothing is simpler than the gospel message in 1 Corinthians 15. I delivered unto you also that which I received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. And God raised him the third day. Amen. That's the gospel. There it is. You repent and you believe Jesus. That's the gospel right there. Nothing is deeper than that simple gospel. I can tell you. Well, what about all of this? He said, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid of something here. I'm afraid. All of these people you're tolerating, they're dividing your loyalty. They're taking your loyalty and he speaks of another Jesus, a different spirit, and a different gospel in this text. Y'all see that in verse 4? That's what he speaks of. Another Jesus. Can I tell you something? There is no other Jesus than, the, than God come in the flesh. Jesus who came in the, God come in the flesh. You know what I'm saying? There is no other Jesus who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Just him. Just the Lord Jesus. When you begin to drift you'll find another Jesus. He may be the Jesus of liberation theology, the one who says you're a victim. You're being oppressed. You're being victimized by this group or that group or the other group. You may find the Jesus of licentious living who says you don't have to repent. You can stay in your sin and you can still follow Jesus. But that's not the Jesus of Scripture. That's not him. By no means. Or a different spirit. There are many spirits out there, aren't there? But there's only one Holy Spirit. Or a different gospel. Can I tell you again? Salvation is by grace through faith. It is not of works. Lest anyone should boast. Salvation is not through church affiliation. Salvation is not by water baptism. As important as water baptism is, salvation is in Jesus. Amen. Now just imagine a bride on wedding day. She makes it down front where the groom awaits. And the closer she comes, the more the groom realizes her gown is wrinkled. There's stains on it, coffee stains. She didn't even comb her hair. Looked like she just got out of bed. She didn't even use makeup. But the ceremony goes on. And the minister says, do you take this man as your lawfully wedded husband? Imagine if she said, yes, I do. Uh, but I want him and him and him too. What do you think that husband would do? He said, y'all hold on. Y'all just wait a minute. We could reverse that order because there are men that I have read about shocked but true who were unfaithful even on their wedding day to their bride. Shocking. But this is where the Corinthian church is. It was as though they said, yeah, we like the Jesus that Paul preaches, but this Jesus that so-and-so preaches, he's much more appealing. That groom on wedding day, he would say, I want your loyalty to me, not to others. And the Lord says to you, the Lord says to the church, I want your loyalty to me. I want you to return to the simplicity of faith where you have single-hearted devotion. 
I want a pure bride. This is what the Lord seeks of you and of me. Purity and simplicity and loyalty, all of these things must describe our walk with Christ Jesus. Nothing complicated about it. As someone said to me this week, simple faith. Simple faith. Folks, it's that simple. Now my question, are you walking in simplicity and purity and loyalty to Jesus. How's your walk? How's your life look? Or are you standing on both sides of the fence? You can't straddle that fence. And you can't do it. No man can serve two masters. How's your loyalty? Father, thank you for this time, this invitation, and this moment. We need to examine our hearts. And I pray in Jesus' name that you'll reveal to 38th Avenue the truth of where their heart is. If they're walking in purity and simplicity and loyalty. And pray, Father, the Holy Spirit will bear upon our hearts This morning, if you need Christ, you turn to Him. This morning, if you need Christ, you open your heart to Him. This morning, if you need a fresh encounter, you take these steps and turn it into a place of prayer. The Lord's coming for a pure bride. No wrinkles in her dress. No stains on her gown. He's making you ready by what he says to your heart now. Father, bless this invitation. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Bo is going to be down front. Uh, Brother Dimitri had to leave out, and I'll be leading this as we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. 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 No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me. Listen to what you're singing. I still will follow. Though none go with me. I still will follow. Let's sing that verse again. Though none go with me, I still will 
follow. Oh, none go with me. I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Let's give the Lord a hand, would you please? Amen. Brother Butch is making his way up front and in this moment, and he'll be dedicating our tithes and our offerings to the Lord. And you give and give faithfully and obediently on this day. Let the Lord be glorified in what you do as you give. And this evening, 5 o'clock, right, Brother Bo? We also have, we have the meeting with uh, VBS as well as prayer. Uh, this is going to be going on during that time. All right? Thank you, Brother Butch. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you right now just praising your name for the many blessings you bestowed upon us for the way you take care of us and watch over us and father we thank you for that and father we ask that you help us to be that servant that you would have us to be that you show us opportunities to share your word and to help others and we'll be faithful and obedient. We thank you for this message, Father. Pray that we'll hide it in our hearts and that we will share it to those around us. And as we come to this time of returning our tithes and offerings, we pray that you will bless each gift and each giver. We ask again a special blessing on our church and a special blessing on our church members that are in the hospital and sick. Just pray that you'll be close, close to them. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. 